exists a place that yields truth so secret that merely thinking about them is guaranteed to upset somebody. Embracing these ideas is so dangerous that simply suggesting you have heard of them will cause immediate outrage on the internet. <laughs> Join me on a journey to this frightening location. Join me as we visit the C++ Dark Side. Hello. I was just reading a story about processors from the 80s. I don't think anybody's going to be interested in those. Do you like stories? I have a good story for you. I've recently become the owner of a box. The box is labelled Forbidden C++ and within lies the most heinous and evil forms of C++ code ever known. Would you like to look inside? <sighs> Dip my hand into the box and see what it yields. Oh yes. Most evil, what a good place to start. Global variables. I'm sure everybody watching this is quite familiar with a variable. There we go, variable A of type integer. And this variable exists within the scope of this main function. The scope is defined by these curly brackets. And we should be familiar with the idea that nothing outside of this scope can see the variable a that I've just created. But what happens when we create a variable that isn't inside any scope? Well, it becomes a global variable. It is within all of the scopes within this file. Now, for a simple one file program such as this, there's nothing wrong at all with that approach. And indeed, it's quite convenient to operate this way. And to all intents and purposes, it behaves like a regular variable. So here I'm outputting the value of that variable from the main function. Global variables start to become more tricky when you've got multiple files in your project. Here I've added three very similar classes to my project. And they all have a function called summMethod. And that summMethod is going to print the global variable. I'll include these at the top of my main program. But straight away we have a problem, because these classes can't see my global variable. And the compiler warns us as such. So what happens if in the uh, global namespace here for all of the classes, I also declare my global variable? Well, we still have a problem. It's now saying there are multiple instances of this global variable. And that's quite right. So how do we bind them all together? Instead, why don't we create a header file called global header and declare our variable in that? And include our global header file in each class. Well, that's not really changed anything. There's still a redefinition. And that makes sense because hash include has effectively just cut and paste the same bit of code into each class header file. We've not really changed anything there. So I need to indicate to the compiler that I want this to be the same variable no matter where it's called. And in my main program, I'm going to create an instance of each one of my classes and call the method. So let's run it. And here we see the result, perhaps somewhat expected. Uh, they all display 666. They've accessed that global variable and are displaying its value. Except that's incorrect. Because I didn't mention this, but class B changes the global variable value. So that's the first thing to worry about. But secondly, even though we changed the global variable's value, when we output from class C, it's outputted 666 again. So clearly, even though the compiler hasn't complained, the program isn't functioning in any way like I intended. So why don't we try throwing some other buzzwords at it? This is what people usually do when they're trying to make global variables work across files. Now it's compiled, it's saying it's got an unresolved external. So now I need to go and add an implementation for this variable. Tell you what, we may as well just do that here. <laughs> 
Now it's got an implementation. Let's run it. Oh, well, at least now it's behaving in a somewhat expected way. But this seems a little bit of a mess. I don't like having to have this implementation somewhere in my code. I want it somewhere tied to where I've declared it, because I could effectively put this anywhere, and I might put it in the wrong place. Well, modern C has a solution for that. We can now declare this as being inline and set its value. Compiles just fine and behaves as expected. This inline keyword has sort of mutated over the last 20 years or so, but one way to think about it now is that when it sees a symbol like this as part of a compile unit, then it's the same across all of the compilable units. So that's made implementing global variables a little easier. But let's not just bypass the big problem we had there. One of our classes did something unexpected to the global variable, and that affected the subsequent behaviour of the program. And that's the really big problem with global variables, is nothing is protecting them and nothing is guarding them. And this can make squashing certain bugs very, very difficult indeed, particularly in large code bases with lots of variables and many files. As programmers, we should always aim to write functions where the end user can anticipate what the expected result is going to be. And on the whole, the C++ language allows us to do that very well, because it has scoped variables. So any variables inside a function somewhere can only really be changed by that function. The fact that a function can change a global variable and therefore alter the state of the entire system without any warning or hint that it has done that to the user means that we get unpredictable behaviour from calling that function. So just be aware of these things when using global variables. For simple applications where you're in full control, nothing wrong with them at all. But for multi-file projects, firstly, they're always a pain to get set up properly. Secondly, they may not always behave the way you expect them to do. And thirdly, they are accessible from absolutely anything and anywhere in your program. Therefore, you've no guarantee what the state of the global variable will be after you've executed some code. Well, let's not stop there. Shall we see what's next? Oh, I hope you've got a strong stomach. Macros. Here is a deliberately simplified program. It has a loop which iterates 20 times and outputs the result of the max function between a random number drawn between 0 and 10 and 5. So what we should expect to see is that the smallest number ever displayed is 5. Let's take a look. Well, here are the results. Uh, I've got 5, oh, I've got a 4, and then a 5, and then a, another 4, and then an 8, that's good. 5, 5, 5, 5, oh, and then a, a 1, um, and then a, another 5, that's good, and then a 2. Hmm. Okay, clearly not working. And this is because, in a rather evil way, max is not a function. It's a macro that I've defined up here. And it's a fairly standard implementation of a maximum macro. And just a little side point, this is also considered really evil for some reason, the ternary operator, but hey. And so to all intents and purposes, it looks and feels like a function. And even in most cases, it behaves correctly. But the thing with macros is they are not executed at runtime. They are purely a preprocessor glorified cut, copy and paste tool for the compiler, which undeniably can also be very, very powerful. You just need to wield this power rather carefully. So why was our result incorrect? Macros are just a copy and paste tool. So even though they can take in arguments, in this case A and B, let's copy and paste this manually. So what we see here are the two arguments that I supplied to the macro. Wherever we see the argument A, we're going to copy and paste in the corresponding argument. And we'll do the same for B. Now we've inflated the macro, let's just tidy up this ternary operator so we can understand what decision it's making. So this is the equivalent of saying, if this is true, then return 5, else return our first argument. And here we can see the problem. The original test is fine, but one of the possible answers is to call the random function again when in reality what that should be returning is the result of the argument we passed in in the first place. 
Don't forget, this has happened at compile time, so this code up here hasn't been executed at any point. It's just a copy and paste tool. So what can we do instead? Well, my golden rule is that if you have something that behaves like a function, it should be a function. In this case, I'm going to call the standard max function out of the standard library. I've accessed that via the algorithm header. This will now behave as we expect, so let's take a look. And here I've got 57559585. There are no numbers less than 5. But don't feel you have to avoid macros entirely. Sometimes they offer quite interesting utility. So here is a macro that takes in a parameter s and then declares a variable called s and assigns it to the string value of s. It turns out macros have quite a bit of syntax of their own and if you google it you can find all of the different keywords and symbols that are involved. And this allows us to do rather obscure things like this and this might be another reason why people think they're evil is because you're starting to break all of the known conventions of the language and you're basically just making up your own. Here I've created a struct called test, but don't forget this isn't executed at runtime, it's executed at compile time. So if I create an object of my struct, t, and I'm just going to go into the debugger here to look at what t contains. So if I highlight t and expand on the window, it's got four string type variables, each initialized with the name of the variable. Effectively, macros allow us to automate the construction of our own code. They also allow you to play cool pranks on your coding buddies. But be careful not to abuse them, simply because it's easy to move the program away from what the programmer can sensibly expect. And that will only lead to frustration and difficulty debugging your programs. I think we're getting to the point where we both want this to be over as soon as possible. Let's get on to the next one. Oh, that's just truly disgusting. Go to. I feel that poor old GoTo gets an unnecessarily hard time. Its origins lie in programming languages that weren't as sophisticated as what we have today. And effectively, it allows you to label parts of your program, so here I've got part 1 and part 2, and at any point I can jump to that part. So in this case, if y equals 1, I'm going to jump to part 1, and if y equals 2, I'm going to jump to part 2. So if I jump to part 2, Part 1 is never executed. The primary problem with GoTo in C++ is that it will lead to spaghetti code. Not it might, it will. And as your programs get more sophisticated, if you start to lean on GoTo too much, you're jumping backwards and forwards all over the place. And it can also lead to unexpected bugs and behaviour. To your program, this label is invisible. So it doesn't partition any of the code within the region that is labelled as being distinct from any other code. So in this case, if I jump to part 1, I'll jump here and execute x++, but then I'll immediately execute x++. So to counteract that, I need to use yet another go-to. We'll have a part 3 to make sure that I skip part 2. As you might expect, this example is deliberately simplified. But it does demonstrate a bit of an anti-pattern where we're using go-tos to implement subroutines. We don't need to implement subroutines like this in a language which can natively handle subroutines. In this code, if we were to refactor it to have its intended purpose, the obvious answer is to simply perform the operation we want when we need it. And get rid of the go-tos entirely. The if construct provides enough functionality to make sure that we're not executing code we shouldn't be executing. And it can be argued that if you're using goto in your code, you can always replace it with something a little bit more intelligent, enhancing encapsulation, making the code clearer, and reducing the possibility of bugs. As I've just demonstrated, when you start using gotos, you tend to end up requiring more gotos. And I believe it's probably safe to say that if you do find yourself using go-tos, then you've some sort of design or logic problem with your algorithm. That's not to say go-tos don't have some utility. Here I've added three nested for loops, and there is an explicit condition inside the bottom of the nest 
that I want to capture and then behave differently. Perhaps I no longer need to carry on iterating through all of these for loops. This becomes a very big computational bottleneck in an algorithm. Perhaps if I'm searching for something as soon as I've found it within this three-dimensional space, then I want to stop the search. Now, I could use breaks and continues to break out of the for loop in a more conventional way. But in this instance, there's absolutely nothing wrong with using a go-to to just break out of all of the loops at once, and then carry on doing what I'm doing with the results. And in my experience, it's situations like this where you do see the use of go-to being used properly, particularly for error handling and in situations where you need to capture when all else fails. You can always go to a location in your algorithm which can reset the algorithm to a known state. So don't use GoTo for subroutines, but do think about its use carefully when you need to capture exceptional circumstances. The bravery you are showing is commendable. Let's keep pressing forward. Oh, well I wasn't expecting this one. Void Star. One of the standout features of the C++ language is it is a typed language. Nothing exists in this system without having some sort of type associated with it. We have integers and floats and we can define our own types in the forms of structs and classes. Void star is often frowned upon because fundamentally it removes the type from a pointer. And once you've removed that type, you can turn that data into anything you want. So void star permits tremendous flexibility. Let's consider this small example. Here I've got a struct. Uh, assume this is a very complicated struct, but it's got some different types within it. And I'm going to create a little utility function, dump to file, which will simply dump the binary data in that struct to a file. So in my main program, I'm going to create an instance of my structure, and I'm going to call my dump to file function. Notice here I'm passing in the address of the object. So I'm passing in a pointer. I'm also passing in the size of the object, and we'll see why in a minute. Very crudely, I'm going to create an output file stream in binary mode. I'm going to write to that stream, and then I'm going to close that stream. Notice that the argument is void star. This means I really don't care what type A is. All I care about is where it exists in memory. And so as soon as I've entered this function, A is just a number. It is a memory address. I know nothing about what it is pointing to. So if I want to write it to the file, I also have to provide the size of the object in bytes because I don't know when to stop writing to the file. I don't know what A is. All I know is it's a starting location. In order to make A compatible with the write function, I need to cast it to type char. And so this is quite a powerful thing because I can use this one function to dump any kind of object in my program to a file. If I did want to retrieve my original object back, I'd have to cast the void star pointer back into something sensible. So here I'm performing the cast, and uh, because b isn't a pointer, I actually need the value at the location after that cast, and there's my object b. So I've reconstructed my test structure from the void star pointer that was passed into the function. But I could quite legally also cast it to absolutely anything else and it will be interpreted as such. There'll be no sort of translation or clever manipulation of the memory. Whatever memory exists at that void star location will now be read as a double. And this is quite a useful technique when you're dealing with lower level programs where you don't necessarily need to care about the type of the information. All you care about is where it starts in memory. However, C++ is a typed language and it's good practice to try and keep things in their original type. After all, this line here makes absolutely no sense at all. And I'll also add, fundamentally, a void star on its own, other than being a memory address, is quite useless. You'll always need to cast it to something else. And as a programmer, you need to take care that you're casting it to something sensible, or indeed the right thing. So, as I mentioned before, quite useful for low-level I.O. and things, such as writing to a file, because all I really care about are the bytes. I don't care about the type. And so I can use this one function to handle any object in my system. Very powerful thing. But it's only as good as the documentation and the programmer that's using it. The compiler will see nothing wrong with this line, yet it's complete gobbledygook and could potentially lead to very difficult to track down bugs. And that's really where the problem with void star begins.
it is rarely the case that we ever want to remove the type of an object in a program. So let's look at an alternative method which allows similar flexibility but does things in a slightly more modern way. I'm going to include the any library from the standard library and rewrite my function to support the any type coming in. So any is effectively a modern C++ wrapper for void star. And whereas void star is completely typeless, at least here we've got a type of some description. It is a standard any. So immediately that signifies to the programmer, hey, this could be anything at all. We use it in much the same way as a void star, but it does come with an added feature. Let's say I wanted to bring back the original object, so I passed it in as an any, but I want to convert it back to type test. Well, I can do that with standard any cast, and that's very nice. But let's say I wanted to cast my any variable into something that doesn't make sense. So here I'm trying to cast it to a double like we did before. So I'll just change my main program here to call the new function. And you'll notice I'm no longer passing the address because I'm passing in a reference. And we'll run it and see what happens. Well, it throws an error. It throws exception unhandled, standard bad any cast at memory location whatever. And it's highlighted the line here that, hey, look, it made no sense to convert this any into a double because the original type was of type test. So that's given us a degree of protection from stopping us doing unnecessarily dodgy and foolish things with this generic general purpose variable. Quite a powerful safety feature. And because it was an exception, we could potentially wrap up this instruction inside an exception handler and catch it at runtime without terminating our program. Well, I must say, I'm impressed. Well done, you've made it this far. Not many people have a stomach like you. Let's see what's next. Oh dear. Using namespace STD. Those of you that have been programming long enough will recall that we used to call a function like this. Though nowadays you may have noticed that calling a function is a little bit more involved. And this has happened due to the introduction and acceptance of namespaces which are effectively syntactic prefixes to function names and variables. So we can use the same function names and variables, but in different packages or libraries or contexts. For example, here I'll create two namespaces, ns1 and ns2. And both of these namespaces contain a function called test function. The implementation of the functions is different. And if I want to call a particular function, I use the namespace as the prefix and I can make the distinction between the two. The compiler is very happy with this and if I run this program we'll see it's outputted the two unique strings. And it's quite a common approach for library developers to wrap up their functionality in a namespace. In fact probably the universal best example of this is the pixel game engine. It exists in the OLC namespace. And effectively what this has allowed me to do is I can create functions with any kind of name. I know that as long as we reside only in the OLC namespace, I'm not going to be copying the names of other functions, leading to confusion. So what exactly is the problem with using namespace STD? Well, in a simple single file program like this, there isn't really a problem. In fact, it makes things quite convenient. I don't need to type the namespace in front of all of the functions potentially the code becomes clearer. But the reason it's considered evil is for the potential of namespace contamination. Now, I must have been exceptionally lucky throughout my programming career because I don't recall ever having encountered namespace contamination, but it can potentially happen. The standard library is huge, and as we include more and more parts of it, we're bolting a lot more functionality into that namespace there are perhaps thousands of functions and variables contained within. So let's bring in our good old max function from earlier. It's a function this time. And then I'll try to use it. So a equals max of 3 and 10. Very trivial example as usual. But what you may have just noticed there was the IntelliSense environment in Visual Studio telling us something. There are five possible implementations of this max function. The first four are contained somewhere within the standard library. 
and number 5 here is the one that we've created. Compiling the program doesn't seem to yield a problem, and on the whole it shouldn't, but can we really be sure which version of this max function we're calling? Sure, they both perform a similar operation, but they needn't. This is just an example of something with a known name. And so in situations like this, it's quite handy to have a specific namespace specifier to indicate precisely which set of max functions we're choosing from. So now I only get four options, because they're the four functions defined in the std namespace. Mine hasn't even appeared. Now, going back to small programs and trivial examples, here it's not necessarily a problem. We're in control of everything that's going on. But let's suppose we included this line in a header file that we're including. If I just use that header file blindly without looking at its contents, I don't know that it's already included the standard library for this translation unit whilst it's being compiled. Therefore, to the users of my header file, there may be some ambiguity as to which functions they should select. I think on the whole you don't see namespace contamination really being a problem because the compiler is very good at identifying that it's happening. For example, if I use one of my namespaces here, I don't need the prefix anymore. But if I include both namespaces with a function that's called the same thing, we start to see the compiler is flagging up an error, and it's actually quite a verbose error and a meaningful one. It's telling us that there are two implementations of this function, and it can't decide which one to use. Therefore, I suggest a good rule of thumb is to only use using namespace whatever when and where you need it. It's a great way of having to avoid typing out lots and lots of prefixes, therefore making the code a lot clearer. But by placing it in the wrong location, you can make the code ambiguous and more difficult for the end user. I think we've time for one more, for now. <sighs> Well, that is surprising. It's quite a modern one. New and delete. Now, I know some of you will be thinking that you've only just moved on from malloc, and now I'm telling you that new and delete are evil? Well, not quite. Like all of these things, they need to be used with some care. Fundamentally, new and delete are used to allocate memory in your program. And you don't own your memory, your operating system does. So when you ask the operating system for some memory, you should remember to give it back, like a nice person. And on the whole, you might think, well, that's not too difficult. But it's the more subtle cases that catch people out. For example, I'm going to create a simple struct called some object, and it has a constructor and a destructor, so we can visualize when it's being created and when it's being destroyed. All the struct does is store a value, so we can identify that particular object. Now, because I'm trying to keep things brief and simple, I want you to imagine that this some object struct is actually a really complicated struct, with all sorts of complicated rules regarding copying and multiple instances, etc, etc. I'm just keeping it very simple. And in such cases, it might not always be correct or convenient to store the object in a container. Instead, we'd rather store a pointer to the object in the container. And then we might be tempted to do something like this. So we just push back a new object. We've created it and we push the pointer back in. So far, so good. Then at some point in your program, you may decide, well, I'm done with those objects now, so I'll clear that vector. And just to make things a little more complicated, you might decide to do that 100,000 times in your program. This program clearly doesn't make much sense, but imagine that once you've populated your vector, you're going to do something with it here. So let's run this program. Well, we can see lots of objects being created, but here on the right, we can also see that we're consuming memory at quite a rapid rate. It's just constantly and constantly increasing. This is a problem. Imagine my application was some sort of server application, and it was expected to run for months, if not years at a time, with no human maintenance. Eventually, I'd consume all of the memory in my system. This is called a memory leak, and it's because we've not remembered to delete the objects that we've created. We've naively assumed, out of ignorance perhaps, that the clear function of the vector would do something about tidying up the contents of the vector. And if you're coming from a background where you've worked with more modern languages that automatically handle the memory for you, you might be thinking, well, that seems quite a reasonable assumption to make because quite a few other languages go to some efforts to hide memory from you. And when it identifies that some memory exists that you're no longer using, it will quietly clear it up for you. This is called garbage collection. 
but C++ doesn't do that. So a simple fix in this scenario would be to iterate through all of the vector of objects and call the corresponding delete. So let's run this. And now we can see objects are being created and destroyed, and my memory consumption is flat. It's no longer continuously growing. We've plugged that memory leak. Admittedly, this is a trivial example of this problem, and it would be remiss of me not to introduce the more modern C++ way of doing things. As programming in general is trending towards uh, models of ownership and the idea that objects have lifetimes, C++ provides utilities to help us handle this. And we can make a simple modification to this code by instead of using a raw pointer, we'll use a smart pointer. We'll pass it the type of some object. We don't need to specify it's a pointer explicitly anymore. And instead of specifying new, we'll call the make unique function. I now don't need to worry about cleaning up after myself. In fact, I can rely on the clear method of the vector to handle this for me, because the unique pointer, or typically smart pointers in general, are sensitive to when the memory is no longer required and will automatically call delete. Obviously, somewhere buried inside the standard library in the implementation for these smart pointers exists new and delete. It's just it's hidden and guarded from us as end users. So let's run this program. And we can see again, objects are created and destroyed, and I'm not leaking memory. As with all of the little programs I've shown today, in the context of a single file demonstration application, it may seem like there's not really anything wrong with using these techniques. And if you're just starting out on your programming journey, you may be wondering why the uh, more experienced developers out there will quite frequently scream at you about not using any of the techniques shown in this video. Well, even though they could be phrasing it in perhaps a more eloquent way, uh, they do have good intentions. The principle being that as you develop as a programmer, your programs and your projects are going to become more sophisticated and larger. And all of the things I've shown today are great ways to make those projects far more complicated than they need to be. And so in the long term, following some of the guidance from these experienced programmers and doing your best to make sure that you're only carefully using the things I've shown in the video today were appropriate, you'll be a better programmer. Well, I say congratulations. You've made it through the horrors and yet incredible utility of the dark side of C++. I hope this hasn't given you any nightmares and I hope to see you in the future. Good night.